So why do we use the grid method? Well, the grid method is a really handy way uh, to make really accurate paintings or drawings and just generally if you want to show off a little bit. It's been done for about 500 years, so I'd recommend you pick it up as a skill. It could be useful. Hmm. Okay, so how did I make that painting that I just showed you? Well, it's very simple. As I already mentioned, it's the grid reference, a method that's been used since the 15th century or so. Uh, so if it's been good enough for artists over the last 500 years and it's still used today, um, it's probably a useful tool for us. So what do we need? Well, first thing we need is a good steel ruler. Now, you can use a plastic ruler, of course, but this is a 50 centimeter steel ruler. It will last you a long time, and even when you're finished with art, maybe, uh, it's something that's always useful to have in a house. Um, it's durable, it's got a nice sharp edge, and it's very reliable. Yeah. And you'll see in a minute why, for bigger pieces of paper, it's also very useful. Next, you'll need some pencils. Preferably, you'll have a light H pencil in there. That's because you'll want the lines to be as, um, well, invisible as possible. You'll see them, but they won't come up too obviously when you're drawing things out. And you can also rub them way easier. Speaking of rubbing things out, get yourself a little rubber. Whatever it's handy. You can use a putty rubber. Whatever you have at hand. Next, you'll need to print off an image. So whatever it might be. Now, it could be a photograph that you have at home. It could be from a magazine. I'm going to use this image here. And then the last thing you will need is a piece of paper. Now, this is a piece of Fabriano. It's got it's a 200 GSM, so it's quite heavy. Uh, I'm going to use this. And I'm actually going to do another one with some sugar paper. Um, the reason I'm doing two drawings is I'm going to use one for a lino demonstration later. Uh, and I'm going to use one for a oil pastel self-portrait. So, staying with the grid reference, um, what I've done in advance now is I've very simply drawn on here a five centimeter grid on this drawing, on, on this photograph. Now, one of the things people might question is that page is 29.4 wide. So how have I got a multiple of five? Well, I've just simply measured out five 10, 15, 20, 25, and I've just left the excess. That's all, because there's not, there's not much happening over here, so it's not a big deal to lose it. Um, so you're keeping your life easy. Now you can use smaller squares if you want. Um, it just depends. I'm gonna show you how to subdivide later. Um, but for the moment, if you simply spin that page around, and you go again, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, again, here and then over here. Now make sure wherever your corner point is, you pull the ruler straight down. You always want the zero to be in the same place, okay? The reason for that is if you start spinning the rulers around, often uh, that's how you get skewed lines. So simply pull the ruler straight down. Same here, if you're standing in that corner, straight down, and that's how you measure them out. You avoid a lot of complications. I'm gonna demonstrate very quickly on this page how to duplicate that. So, on this page, which should be the same, I'm not shrinking it, it's not a bigger page, it's not a smaller page, uh, I am going to measure out now and show you how quickly this can be done. Now, just get it comfortably in place, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and you can see the 30s off the page, and I'm going to pull this straight down to the bottom, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Now, and then I am going to go into this top corner. Again, I'm going to measure, to keep the square, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40, and we're gonna have a bit of excess. Now, there's an old rule that carpenters have, it's cut. They say, measure twice, cut once. And it's a really valuable rule for artists too. Try and think back to the Renaissance. 
you know, Renaissance artists, you know, they had apprentices, they had workshops. You know, when the local church needed something painted, they contacted the guild and they started organizing things. Uh, so, to join up these places, again, with the measure twice cut once, just take your time, make sure you're happy enough where things are, and just pull that line across. And of course, I've had many more years and many more opportunities to practice drawing these grids. But hopefully you can see that really it's just the willingness to take 10 minutes um, to draw up a few grids. And that's really all it takes. Five to 10 minutes you should be able to bang out a grid. Um, and it will save you so much time at the end of a drawing. I've often seen people finish up a painting and say, well, it's a great painting. It's a pretty, you know, the face has a massive jaw or, you know, the, the eyes are too big. And, you know, the, this, the simplest thing in the world to catch that would have been to just draw up a grid early days. Now, you can see why the, the longer ruler is very handy here as well. Now, you can do this with a smaller ruler. It would just mean um, you would have to do half the measurement and join things up. So, for example, you'd be kind of, let's say you only had a 30 centimeter ruler, you'd be kind of starting here and you'd be coming into about here and then redrawing the rest of it. You know, you could use a long T-square as well to join up the lines. Just whatever's a long, straight, reliable line you could use to join up these. But it's a time saver. Right tools for the right job, as I keep saying. Now, hopefully that will prove to you that that's a relatively quick thing to do. So what we need to do next is clear our space a little bit. Um, I'm gonna do this a tiny bit heavier, I suppose, now. Uh, I'm just gonna number. Now, you can use letters, numbers, you know, you can number it. I've seen people where they've numbered every single grid, so they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah. you get the idea. Um, and that's fine, absolutely fine. Um, I've seen people then just use letters and numbers like A1, A2. So this might remind you of ordnance survey maps in geography. So those survey maps, will have grid references and you have to read north, east and south and all that jazz and you have to figure out where things are. You're basically using the same set of skills. You're also using, um, you've done coordinate geometry in maths where you're plotting points on gridded paper. So you've used these skills before. Um, so we're just replicating these skills. Uh, I'm gonna try out this method of just one, two, three, four, five, and six is my end piece. I'm just going to number off here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Symbols. Uh, I'm going to leave that at one and move down two, three, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Excess. Now, at this point, I will probably start ignoring all this background. It's not that interesting, um, it's not that important for what we're doing. But what you can do is across the top line, there's nothing happening there. So we can ignore most of that. So we're already into line, the second line, so this line here. Now, what I find very handy is drawing little X's on the grids, okay? So if I draw little X's here and here and here, they're just intersection points. Um, and they'll give you a better idea of what's actually happening. So if I come across here, I can see that there's nothing here, nothing here. But then here, it comes out a little bit. It's probably about here is where my head is going to intersect. Over here as well. It's about there. This one, a little bit lower. And there might even be part of you thinking, but that looks wrong. Well, it's just the beginning. And that's kind of part of the interesting things of these drawings. So if you take this, for example, this point is interesting because it's just above, that's about midway, that's above midway. So thinking about where the midpoint is can also be helpful. This little X here, it's inside the midway 
um, on the five grid. So if I come down here, that's about if that's about halfway, I'm coming in in about there. Now you can do a join up later on if you want. I'm just going to quickly show you how that might already be coming together. And because I'm drawing it lightly, I can always come back and make small alterations. So that's all that started there. And come down to about here. Now I might put this on fast mode so I can finish up this really quickly. So um, when you get to the next section, you'll see that this is gonna blitz by in a second. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is show you another little trick um, for accuracy. So if you're worried about where eyes are, lips, nose, um, which is a very common issue, um, what we can do is use subdivision within the grids. So I can go into these grids and subdivide. So because it's five centimeters, I can go two and a half down here, two and a half. And subdivide it, and it will make my life a little bit easier. And of course, I can do the same thing on the page I'm drawing on. And it will just help you understand where things actually are, not where you think they are. Because that's a very important difference. Even when I'm doing this, there's times where I'm like, oh, is that in the right place? So in a weird way, you kind of just have to wait until you get to the end. You just have to trust the methods, trust that things are in the right place. Your brain will play little tricks. So I like to use the nose as an example because our nose is quite large. It's a really important part of uh, our body. So kind of doing these dainty little Disney noses is never really a great idea. Um, you kind of want to think about how big they actually are. So if I start on this nostril here, you can see it's on just this side in that subdivision, um, roughly speaking. You also don't want to think too much about, oh, I'm drawing a nostril. Try and think of the shape that's there. I can kind of see a, 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 a sail shape. And I'm going to leave it at that. And then I'm going to come this side. And you can see this nostril nearly comes to the right to the edge. And again. And when you get to the end of the drawing, you start shading things in, it makes more sense again, because it's a 3D image we're trying to create. There's a lot more shading on this side of the nose. Later on, we'll be shading that in properly. Um, but for the moment, I'm just gonna leave little icons for myself to pay attention to. Now, I can also use this subdivided grid for the eyeball. So the eyeball here, coming down around halfway, and it's going to end up in around here and again I am going to just finish off this image and I'm going to fast forward that so you can see how easy it really is.
Another thing worth remembering is if you don't have a printer handy, you can use a number of apps. So you can kind of get these uh, apps uh, on your App Store, your iStore or whatever, uh, and you can get these grid apps. There's hundreds of them out there. You can also find websites that will allow you to put a, a grid straight onto an image if you want to do it that way as well. So uh, if you want to avoid some of the uh, work and you want to work from a phone, you can do that. The other thing I would recommend is going into your settings and changing the display that it never turns off when you're working on this. So you just go into your settings, you go to your display settings and you should be able to set that the phone never goes off. Um, um, in, in which case you, the image will stay there. You don't have to keep clicking the image. I hope that helps as a little tip as well. So as you can see now, I have finished gridding up the image um, in the last few minutes. So basically, there are, everything's in the right place. Now, this is not a particularly super drawing at this stage. It just have, it has everything in its right place. Um, but there's no shading done. I've just done a few little scribbles, just to little reminders to kind of fill in areas. Because I'm not gonna sit and do the whole thing, I'm just gonna do a section of it to kind of show you what can happen. Now, another trick that we're gonna do is a bit of tonal work. Um, so I'm gonna have this as a separate exercise again, but I'm gonna hijack a part of the page here. I'm gonna take a little section here. I'm gonna divide it into seven little squares. And with that, I'm gonna show you how you can use tone to create interesting shapes. So just bear with me now, and we'll go again on another subdivision. Now, of course, you can do these much smaller if you want. I'm just doing them nice and big, so they're a little bit more legible. The idea is each of these squares, so we're just going to number them like this. You're going to put down a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the idea is 0, there's nothing there. Now, what we want to do is identify here where the darkest points are and where the brightest points are. The 0 being the brightest and the 7 being the darkest. Um, this is going to go on fast forward mode for a moment. And you can see then what I produce. And I, what I'll do is I'll take a section of probably one of the eyes and show you how you can use that method to create a far more realistic eye. As you can see for the moment, it's a bit rudimentary. It's a bit simplistic. We're gonna show you how to show off on that in a second. So bear with me and I'll do the fast forward now. Now that we have the zero to seven, we can basically uh, transfer this to here to here to kind of identify where the darkest part. Now, it's a common misconception. People will often just do everything very light. Um, and that's a pity because to create structure and tone, uh, to kind of create that 3D effect, you really want to use a full range of, of shading. This idea of staying between zero and three is very shallow. Be brave, go right into those five, six, seven, uh, but you won't be using tons of it, just like, so the zero and the seven should be used sparingly. Um, they should only appear a handful of times. Um, the three and the four should be very common, but I'm only gonna do one small section. Now, another trick here is, um, if you're doing shading and we have a natural 
um, oil in our skin. If we are running that through the graphite, we'll often pick up the graphite and smudge things. Now, you can tidy up at the end, but it's a big time saver to simply put a piece of paper on top of something that may be shaded already. Um, it's very simple just to put that in place so that when you go to shade something in. Now, another few tricks. Graphite sticks are brilliant for filling in areas as well. There's a 2B graphite stick. Uh, so I might just use this really quickly to help me get things started. I'm gonna do this section here, come and bring in back uh, this image, and I'm gonna use this graphite stick to help me kind of move things along. So again, this is probably going to fast forward uh, just to show you how this can be brought together quite fast, okay? So hopefully it's starting to come together a bit now. You can see how it's quite dark. It's been kept dark for that reason uh, because in fact the whites of the eyes are more like a grey tone. And I've just tried to bring up a few sections here and there. This is just very quickly done as an example of what you could be doing. Now, I'm gonna use the rest of this drawing to ink things up actually uh, for a lino. But for the moment, I think you get the idea of how you can use uh, a combination of things you can use the grid method, uh, you can use the tonal bar. So just to remember, you've got the tonal bar here, which is very effective, very useful tool. That's this guy here. Um, and you can use a bit of this tonal bar in your drawing to create a far more realistic image. Um, as you keep working on that, and as you kind of build it up bit by bit, you will get there and you'll have a far more interesting drawing for your troubles. Uh, I hope it works for you and uh, I hope that video has been useful.